In this quick overview of the 6809, um, we'll try and show you a little bit about and won't cover the great differences between them and the other microprocessors of the time, um, but we'll try and show how to connect them up in a simple circuit and make the things work. Um, a quick overview of what we have in front of us here. These are two original Motorola um, ceramic packaged 6809s with the gold and the purple. Um, these are plastic pack later versions. In here we have uh, a faster version because these originally worked at 1 megahertz and used a 4 megahertz crystal with them. Um, this one here is is the A09 which was faster it ran at one and a half meg with a 60 sorry a 6 meg crystal and then we have finally the 68B09 which is the fastest of the lot which needs an 8 meg crystal and ran at 2 megahertz. These two I've just thrown in for good measure is the 63 09, in fact they're 63B 09s and they were the CMOS version. They were a much later version than these and ran at a much lower power level. They had uh, increased facilities but they were basically software compatible um, with the 6809 itself. Um, it's a matter of preference which one is better. There are many people who swear that the 6809 is better because it has a better instruction set. Some say the same for the Z80. There are some significant differences if you're going to design bits and pieces with them. I have a tendency to choose the Z80 because it has more registers and I just find it easier to sometimes not put a RAM in and you can get away with it because there's so many registers in it um, that you, you can just leave the RAM out altogether. But there we go. Uh, a big difference, a big plus on the 6809 is it has a clock generator on board. So you just hang a crystal on the appropriate pins and with two capacitors and it works. You do need obviously a separate oscillator for the Z80 for that to work as well. Um, another difference is the fact that all the IOs and memory are treated exactly the same with the 6809 whereas the Z80 separates them out and you have IO requests and memory requests depending whether you want an IO or a memory um, address. When programming these two obviously the program steps are completely different but the, there is a big difference in as much as when you start with a, the Z80, everything starts at the bottom at four zeros. But when you do a reset on a 6809, it jumps right to the top of the memory and obtains its vectors to show where the memory is. So they're called reset vectors. So you have to have your memory at right at the top so that you can put those in the store. And then it jumps down to where it is. Uh, I mean, in the case we're going to show in a minute, you'll find that the we have the 8K ROM right at the top of the memory in it and um, therefore the vectors are up there already and it jumps back down to E000 and that is where the program will start. So all of the programming that I do with, with these when I'm using an 8K always end up right starting at E000. Whereas with this, the Z80, it starts at four zeros because it's always at the bottom. Here are two 6809 processor boards I inherited some time ago. Um, they in fact are both the same circuit only difference. They're both meant to be used with a PC80 keyboard. So that goes back a few years doesn't it? Um, as there don't seem to be any AT keyboards around I very much doubt it will ever work like that ever, ever again. Hence the two transistors on each one. The difference between this one and this one as you can see is the fact that there's a display being put in the bottom and likewise it's a crystal oscillator here rather than having a, a crystal which is completely separate. This is a slightly better version of the circuit. As I said, I'm going to put this up later on, right at the end of this video. For anybody who's interested, you can see the reset circuitry now showing quite clearly that the clock going in straight into the 6809. These are the bits for the AT keyboard, etc. There's the decoder, um, the ROM, the RAM. In this case, it's just 2K. And then we have the serial controller. And this one at the end is a less parallel output. This is for the serial option. This is a 2.4576 megahertz crystal and this drives the 8530 which gives a proper serial output with ASCII output. I thought we'd start off by showing this board working. Um, it's a simple build board. Um, there's not a lot on it. You could remove many of these ICs and the thing would still work. In the EEPROM here we have a few locations, probably the minimum you can do to actually make the thing work. Um, I like to put, when I build things at least, I like to put a lead on so the power is around the right way. Well, this one doesn't. Um, likewise, 
a display is useful. There's no display on this. So what we're doing basically is I'm using the absolute minimum. Um, this is a 2 meg crystal, which is interesting because it's half the value it's supposed to be um, if it was a standard uh, 6809. But this is a 68B09, which means it should have an 8 in there. Anyway, that's of no consequence for what we're doing here. So what we do is the program, um, a reminder of what actually happens in the program, one must remember here to always put right at the very top before you start writing your program, if you're doing it by hand, of course, um, at the two locations. One is FFFE and the other is FFFF. And in those, those are the reset vectors and the processor will go straight to those and find out from there where its main program starts. And in this particular instance, it's EOOO. And those are the locations right up at the top, very, very top of the memory. Interesting to note that compared to the Z80, if you're hand assembling this, uh, doing machine code, you'll find that Z80, if you put E, if you had a location E and three noughts, you start off with the low bytes first. So with Z80, you would say OO E naught, whereas this, it's the other way around. It's E naught OO. So there we go. Right, okay, so let's think about the program itself. All we have in the program is we have a stack pointer. Well, as we're not using the stack in this program, it doesn't matter, but it's there anyway. So that's the first four locations. The next location is the code here is B70000. And what that is, is put whatever is in the accumulator out into memory location, or IO, of course, uh, with four zeros. Uh, after that is simply a jump. It's an absolute jump. We jump straight um, back to E004, which is, which is where the put the A register out uh, starts again. I mean, it sounds, it's very simple. That's all it does. It simply puts a value from the accumulator out to, out to a memory location, loops back and does the same again. What this means is if we now look at the actual circuit itself, this is the IO decoder here. Uh, oh, sorry, beg your pardon, the memory decoder and I.O. decoder here. Um, if we look along the, the active pins, you'll find that if you've seen the logic probe before, I'm sure this is just showing a high means it's a high and nothing else. So I've just reset it, reset it there. These are all the outputs of the decoder. So there's nothing at all. They're all high. But that one is clocking. The on-off means that there is a clocking signal. And what we're looking at is we're looking at the processor looping around and sending out to that 4-0 location every time. So there's nothing at all on the others. So that's how we can check the thing works. Obviously, if it doesn't work, um, I can think of a good way of doing that. I'll take out the EEPROM and we'll see what it looks like with no memory in it at all. You can see we've taken out the ROM. And just a quick look with the logic probe on the same pins, you'll find there's nothing now on that. Nothing on any of these coded memory locations. So, there we go. With this second EEPROM, all we've done is add a delay in so that we can see this uh, line flashing slightly slower instead of it going round as fast as it was, as fast as the processor could do. So if we look at the others again, we'll find there's still nothing on all the others are all high, but that one now has a much slower rate we can actually see. Lastly, let's look at this board and we put a, another test EEPROM in here to check this one out as well. Um, can't see it too well in the light, but that's actually reading 6809 in the display and uh, showing that the thing is actually running correctly. Um, interesting, if we have a quick look on that uh, decoder here, like we did last time, if you remember when we had the, the 40 address that was on this pin 15, now there's nothing on it at all. All we're doing is looping around and addressing this each time. So the program does nothing other than simply loop and, and keep readdressing those figures. So if we run down the, the pins, so that is the address for the, the display there and nothing going anywhere else. So there you go. Um, very, very simple description of bits and pieces to do with the 6809. Um, any questions, please ask, of course. Um, but uh, what I'll do now is I'll put those little bits of programming and the circuitry 
at the end here in case anybody wants a little bit of inspiration to start. Thanks for watching.